Okay, hi everyone. So we're gonna get ready and start. So my name is Rachel Darris and I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. I am the library liaison for this event. Uh, for this event. So Spiritual Bodies is the fourth installment of our annual Women's Voices series where we explore women from different times and places through dramatic readings chosen by a faculty specialist, which in tonight's case is the wonderful Tracy T. Meyer. Tracy has selected five voices for us tonight. And before we begin, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to Cynthia Becht, John Jackson, and Carol Raby for their support and guidance in planning tonight's event. Thanks also to Kevin Wetmore, our annual partner from Theater Arts, who chooses and directs our actors. Finally, thank you to Tracy T. Meyer, without whom this night would not be possible, and who has been working for six months to plan the event. So now I present Tracy. That sounded a lot more impressive. Than <laughs> um, excuse me, little girl, but what are you? Huh? You know, where are you from? Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C. Yeah, but where are your parents from? My dad is from Cincinnati, and my mom is from Los Angeles. It's just, you look so different. What's your ethnicity? Oh, I'm half German. <laughs> I, of course, knew exactly what the woman meant all along. But while the woman in the lunchroom of my grade school walked away exasperated, I, a particularly willful child, walked away feeling triumphant. I resented that I was treated as a what and not a who. While my Japanese-American mother converted to Catholicism after she met my father, much of her family was and remains Buddhist. This didn't seem strange to me until we moved from Southern California to St. Louis, Missouri, and my twin brother and I began attending a mostly white Catholic parish school. I got the clear message that only Christians were saved and that to be Christian was to be white. Proper Catholic kids were named after saints while I was named after my female ancestors. Brown girls like me were never chosen for the crowning of Mary in May. But my story is not the tired, simplistic trope of the tragic mulatta. My early years were full of ancestors, saints, home altars, and a rich spiritual life. When I visited family in Los Angeles, we'd attend various Buddhist rituals and festivals. And I was captivated by my grandmother's home altar. The continued relationship my family had with its ancestors was deeply fulfilling to me. I connected ancestor practices to Catholic devotions to saints and became quite the devotee myself. I built my own home altar and made little offerings to my favorite family and saints. Although I was told that this was wrong, idolatrous even, I knew in my heart that this wasn't true. The mixing of ethnicities, religion, and rituals was, to me, empowering for body, mind, and spirit. Women of color are often exoticized, sexualized, fetishized, or demonized. They are imagined through stereotypes, Asia girl, mammy, dragon lady, maid, Jezebel, and reduced to their bodies or their functions in a patriarchal and racist world. But while religion has supported racist and sexist ideologies and practices, even granted them divine sanction, women of color have often refused to cooperate. Even as they experience sometimes crushing psychological, spiritual, and physical realities, they know in their hearts a different possibility, a divine truth that yet breathes life into them and offers all of us new visions of the sacred that are embodied, holistic, communal, and healing. 
Women of color embrace their bodies not as objectified parts to be used, ogled, defined, and categorized by others, but as beautiful, instructive, holy, unruly, resilient, and strong. Today, we hear but a few of these voices as they confront complex realities of race, gender, and religion, and as they open us to see the liberative power of women's spirit-filled bodies at play in the world. Zenju Earthland Manuel grew up in the Church of Christ, but found her way to Soto Zen Buddhism and is ordained in the Suzuki Roshi lineage. Black and queer, she resists the idea that we must let go of our identities or our bodies in our spiritual quest. Ratuja Kashid will now perform a selection from The Way of Tenderness, where Manuel argues that liberation requires honoring our many bodily and social realities. path laid out in the Buddha's teachings. I immediately grieved the missing sense of community found in African-American influenced Christianity. But when I entered the temple, a Zen chant expressing the determination to save all beings inspired me to deepen my quest to end suffering, especially the suffering of dehumanization. The words liberation, compassion, love, and wisdom felt like drops of medicine on my heart. When I was ordained as a Zen priest, I was given the Dharma name Zenju, which means complete tenderness. I did not see myself as tender in the sense of being soft. I felt the raw and wounded kind of tenderness. It was clear at the beginning of my exploration that I had been hardened by the physical violence leveled against me as a young child and by the poverty with which my parents had to struggle. I had been hurt as a child when I discovered that others saw my dark body as ugly. And as I aged and moved from romantic relationships with men, I lived in fear of being annihilated for taking a woman as a lover and a partner in life. I had grown bound to feelings of injustice, rage, resentment. So how does someone who has experienced deep hatred from within as well as without become Zenju, complete tenderness? I listened to Zen teachers address suffering with Buddhist teachings. I listened for what might help me to face rage and to develop a liberated tenderness. Some suggested that if I just dropped the labels, I would be liberated. If I could just let go of being this or that, my life would be freed from pain. What I found is that I needed to bring the validity of my background to the practice of Dharma. I am not invisible, I wanted to shout. Dojin Zenji, founder of the Soto Zen tradition, said, to study Buddha is to, this way to study the self. We must acknowledge the relevancy of our lived experience. Our identities in terms of race, sexuality, and gender cannot be ignored. We are not capable of being unembodied selves, nor are we meant to be. My beloved and I were at a popular grocery store. We were ready to order breakfast and were the only customers at the counter. It was clear that we were together there as a couple. We stood there for quite a long time waiting to be served. The server looked at us for a moment and then gazed off again, as if we weren't there. Soon a young man comes in, not black like us. He steps to the counter without asking if we've been helped. The server quickly takes his order. The server acted without saying a word about our blackness, our queerness, or anything at all about our embodiment. Yet there was a wider psychic feel behind all three of us, created by our collective past history. That rendered the server incapable of acknowledging the lives before her. Could my beloved and I have a raw, sore tenderness and be well? Yes. If we could arouse a complete tenderness that recognizes and acknowledges life's distortions. If we could experience the server as one who harbors a distorted view, even though we were the ones who felt the pain, we would be less likely to want to hurt her in the way she hurt us. We do not have to make room for her hatred, but by acknowledging our lives in the realm of oneness, 
we would be acknowledging her life as well. Rina Nakashima Brock is a Japanese Puerto Rican American Christian who questions why Christianity has emphasized Jesus' suffering because of her own experiences with racism and violence. Does the emphasis on a father who sends his son to suffer and die make God a kind of divine child abuser? Natasha Aquino will share a selection from Proverbs of Ashes where Brock invites us instead to honor Jesus' community, vulnerability, and presence to others. I stepped into the aisle of the school bus and felt a stabbing pain in the back of my head, right between my pigtails. And I turned. This white girl stood just behind me. Her flushed face was ringed with frizzy red hair and her narrow blue eyes blazed and her mouth was tightened into a scowl. And in her upraised fist, she held a sharpened pencil pointed at my eyes. Don't you ever dare step in front of me again, you dirty Jap, she hissed. I looked away quickly and hurried off of the bus, shocked by her violence and fury. I washed the blood off of my head in the bathroom and quietly found my way to the classroom. I spent the entire day mulling over what had happened. What had I done to provoke such fury when I had simply stepped into the, into the aisle just like the boy in front of me? What was wrong with being Japanese? The next morning when my mother was fixing my <coughs> hair, she asked about the cut on my head. I was too ashamed and embarrassed to tell her the truth. I said I hit my head in the playground. I didn't want to worry her. I had no language to describe what had happened or to explain my confusion, anxiety, and sadness. They remained buried inside of me. Children at school occasionally called me names like Chink or Jack and made fun of me by pulling the corners of their eyes up tight. Taunting me increases time. A minefield. I figured out who the mean kids were and I avoided them, but it was difficult. How does a seven-year-old child defend herself against random and incomprehensible hostilities? I formed a flesh of bronze to shield myself from arrows of hate. Inside that metallic skin, I could pretend that I did not feel the sting of scorn, the humiliation of contempt, that I was impervious to hate. My pain remained hidden as undigested lumps frozen in time. I made sure I did nothing to provoke ridicule, nothing to embarrass myself. I became disdainful of my own vulnerabilities. As long as I faced outward from that shield, I could deny the pain within. Even now, sometimes, when hurt, I retreat behind that shield. I have become emotionally unavailable, unavailable to others. I can be indifferent or cruel. I ignore my own pain, resorting first to fury. Anger allows me to deflect the pain off the surface of bronze. I survived being Japanese in Kansas, but sometimes I can't help but feel that white girl won. I have concluded that Christianity has interpreted Jesus' life in ways that reinforce my trauma. I was isolated by the traumatic events of my childhood, and Christian tradition isolates Jesus as a singular savior, alone in his private relationship with God. He is depicted as unique and separate, carrying salvation on his own solitary shoulders. And his relationship with others are described 
paternalistically as if they needed him, but he did not need them to be saved. I was supposed to have an isolated relationship with him to need him when he did not need me. I knew from my own experience there is no grace in such isolation. Isolating Jesus from those relationships carried forward the trauma of violence without healing it. If, I, if Jesus did not participate in such bonds, if he was isolated, he could not offer any grace. <clears throat> Jan Willis grew up in Alabama as the daughter of a Baptist deacon and as actively involved in the civil rights movement. Study abroad led her to Tibetan Buddhism and to reframe her sense of race, racism, and the struggle for justice. Jessica Dickerson will now perform a selection from Dreaming Me, where Willis refuses to believe that religion has to be an either-or proposition and identifies instead as both Baptist and Buddhist. and towel draped across his arm, headed for the bathroom on the other side of the house. For a brief moment, he paused and looked at me piercingly. And before continuing his journey, he said, living with pride and humility in equal proportion is very difficult, isn't it? Very difficult. In that moment, it seemed to me that he had put his finger on one of the deepest issues confronting not only me, but all African Americans. There is a great existential difficulty in attempting to count oneself a human being equal with all others after suffering through experiences of centuries of slavery. It is the trauma of slavery that haunts African Americans in the deepest recesses of their souls. This is a chief issue for us, the issue that must be dealt with head on, not denied, not forgotten, not suppressed. Tibetan Tantric Buddhism offers tools to help with this dilemma, for it provides methods to show both how to get those deep inner wounds and how to heal them. One method, for example, employs a meditative notion of divine pride. According to this theory, we all are inherently pure and divine at our cores. Our task is to only but realize this truth. There is, of course, a very fine line between confidence and arrogance. Belief in one's own innate purity and power can easily be confused with an all-too-human pridefulness. The consequence of misunderstanding this crucial distinction and thereby going astray is the creation of more suffering rather than the elimination of it. Once returning from the airport, I had a thoroughly frightening experience. As usual, I was flying Delta Airlines. I was feeling pretty relaxed. However, the temperatures all up and down the East Coast were pretty frigid, and this caused a great deal of turbulence. We were no more than a few feet above the ground. The landing gear was down, the headlights illuminated the field. Then things abruptly changed. The, the plane veered steering upward. We were almost perpendicular. We were like astronauts, our heads pushed up against our seats, our bodies feeling the g-force of liftoff. My knuckles went white. Papers from somewhere started to blow through the, the compartment. Overhead, the doors snapped open. The oxygen masks fell. Some people started to scream. I started to pray. At first, out loud, and then silently, it sped up with urgency. I screamed, Lama Yeshi, may I never be separated from you in this life or others. Gripping my armrest, I continued in silence. May you and all the Buddhists help and bless us all. Without pausing, I said, Christ Jesus, please help us, please. I, I pray, bless me and all these people. I call myself a Baptist Buddhist. Not to be cute or witty, I call myself a Baptist Buddhist because it is an honest description of who I feel I am. 
When I was on that plane, racing straight up through the sky, I didn't feel like I was hedging my bets. I felt sheer and utter terror. And I called upon both traditions for help. Long ago, Kierkegaard had argued that one does not know what one really believes until one is forced to act. That climbing plane showed me what I believe. Leila Ahmed grew up Muslim in Egypt, surrounded by women and their visions of the divine. As the first professor of women's studies and religion at Harvard Divinity School, she challenges the emphasis on male interpretations of religion. Ratuja Kashid will per perform a selection from a border passage from Cairo to America, where Ahmed reflects on how women's approaches to Islam are bodily, communal, non-textual, and just as authoritative as men's approaches. Growing up, our lives were lived in women's time, in women's space, and in women's culture. And these women too, I believe, had their own understanding of Islam, an understanding different from the men's or the official Islam. For although in those days it was grandmother who recited all the regular formal prayers, for the women in the house, religion was a way of making sense of and understanding their own lives. It was through religion that one pondered the things that happened, why they happened, and what one should make of them. Islam, as I got from them, was gentle and generous, pacifist, inclusive, somewhat mystical, like they themselves were. And believing in Islam was about believing in a world in which life had meaning and all events and happenings were permeated, although not always visibly to us, with meaning. Religion, above all, was about inner things. Outward signs of religiousness, such as fasting or praying, might be signs of true religiousness, but equally well might not. It certainly wasn't what was important about Islam. What was important was how you conducted yourself, and how you were in yourself and in your attitude towards others, and in your heart. What it was to be Muslim was passed on, besides very basic beliefs in the moral ethos of Islam, like that of its sister monotheisms, as a way of being, a way of holding oneself in the world. And this the woman passed on through their thoughts, beliefs, and ways, and how we should be in a world, through touch, through glance, through words. And their reactions in situations, a word, a shrug, or even their mere posture was passed on by women and by men to their young, how we should be. And all this passing of beliefs, morals, attitudes, knowledge, through touch, through glance, through being, was in its own way subtle and evanescent. This profoundly shaped the next generation and left a record, not necessarily a written record like someone who writes a text leaves a record, but a more vital, important, and living record. Attitudes, beliefs, morals passed on and are impressed on us. They're written into our very being, ourselves even into our physical selves and how we live out the script of our life. My mother and I had a very memorable exchange about religion once. We were in her room, the windows rolled down, the curtains billowing, the garden behind us. And she recited to me a verse from the Quran. He who kills one being kills all of humanity. And he who revives or gives, gives life to one being, gives life to all of humanity. It was a verse that she recited quite often growing up when we talked about religion and Islam in particular. To her, it represented the essence of Islam.
Monica Coleman is an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church who has been influenced by evangelical Christianity, black church traditions, and indigenous spirituality. In bipolar faith, she reflects on her lifelong dance with trauma and depression. Jessica Dickerson will share a selection from the book where Coleman insists that sometimes prayer is not enough and instead constructs a vision of the divine that can sustain her in the darkness. I died. That night, I was raped. I died. I was 21 years old. The loss was total, but I dealt with it piecemeal. School assignments, trying to sleep, Losing my job, getting another job, telling people, going to group therapy, going to church after church after church. I was so busy trying to stay alive that I hadn't known that I had died. That's why it took me years. But everything was gone. That long night and morning while it rained, I died. Depression mocked me. I was a kitten, pawing, lurching, chasing after the string that unraveled from the spool held by an entertained owner, except there was no force outside of me playing catch me if you can with my life. The depression was inside me. I went to the campus counseling center. The therapist asked me about my schoolwork. Do you have any incompletes? I finished them out. How's your GPA? 4.0. How do you like your program? It's cool, I'm being challenged, learning what I wanted to learn. Her assessment, I wasn't depressed, I was lonely. I just needed better social connections. I knew the difference between loneliness and illness. I tried another psychiatrist, a mother of a good friend. She knew I was a minister, she even knew my Nashville church. I began to feel comfortable. I told her about the woman at the counseling center. I told her that I was looking for a referral for a psychiatrist in my part of town. She told me I didn't need a doctor. I needed Jesus. I didn't hear a word she said after this. After sharing my doctor frustration with a minister friend, he assured me it will get better. You think I asked? You have to have faith. He insisted. I do, I immediately replied. No, listen. You have to have faith in the medicine. You have to believe it can help you or it won't. Hey, if it can get me to sleep, I'll worship it, I joked, hiding my insecurity and desperation. He played along with me. It's not idolatry. If you really believe that God is in everything, if you really believe that, you have to know that God is in the medicine too. Three days later, I sat in the office of the 12th doctor I'd seen in four months. Bipolar 2. Bipolar 2. Bipolar 2. The naming helped me feel sane. Hearing myself described so well, down to the little details, suggested that the happy, studious, successful part of me wasn't just a lie or a facade or a mask I wore to hide my depressions. Rather, happiness was a part of who I was as well. The name, Bipolar 2, officially said that I was more than depression. There is, there has always been another side to me, and it is no less real than the sad side. I'm a teacher. I'm a writer, I'm a poet, I'm a minister, I'm church, I'm dance, I'm the breath of the ancestors, I'm the joy of God, I'm my grandmother's dreams, I'm my grandfather's prayers, I'm incense burning, I'm a woman, I'm the woman who loves the company of other women. I'm alive, I'm whole, I'm a person who feels Deeply, I'm a woman who believes in freedom. I'm a woman who fights for freedom. <coughs> I'm a co-journeyer. I'm a friend. And I'm 
loved by so many. So I think we can see that if men's approaches to religion often have emphasized the intellect and texts over body and practice, um, women of color weave us a new kind of tapestry. Um, it's complex, it's sometimes contradictory, ambivalent, rich with psychological, physical, and societal um, imagery and complexity. But one of the things that I think that these women can teach us all is that body and spirit are not separate realities. The body itself is spiritual, and it is the very medium through which healing and liberation occur. Uh, I want to thank these wonderful actors for bringing um, the women's voices to life. They did a wonderful job. These women have all been immensely um, powerful in my own spirituality and working through my own spiritual issues. And it's an honor for me to be able to share these voices with you today. So thank you very, very much. Time for discussion. You can ask um, me or the actors questions. Um, I'll moderate. So if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand and, and direct your question or your comment to one of us. Very brief. But what was the name of the last um, piece that was formed? Monica Coleman. So the the book is called Bipolar Faith. And it's written by a woman um, at Claremont, um, Monica Coleman, writing about, it's a spiritual autobiography about, um, she starts all the way from childhood into her career right now. It's a wonderful book to read. I recommend all these books. <laughs> Maybe I can ask the actors how they connected with the pieces, if it was difficult, or how they like segued in if there were things from their own life that they, you know, channeled into their work. Let's just start. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for the first piece I did, Jane, or Jan, Jan, what's your name? Jan Willis. For the first piece, I connected through, of course, the African-American spirituality. It's very important to realize that not just African-Americans, but all <coughs> cultures have suffered. So I took into part just how everyone feels in their day-to-day -day life, like, what you feel when people question you and things like that. And so that's why I embodied her piece. It was a little bit more difficult just because I haven't had a death-defying experience like she did on that plane, but I can imagine it. <laughs> um, and the second piece that I did, Monica Coleman, hers was really, really intimate. Hers was her story of rape and how she overcame this and how she was able to feel not normal in a sense that everyone thinks, but how she could be herself and feel okay doing that that it's okay to have both the sad and the happy, that both are true. You're not faking your happiness, you are happy at times. And I feel like that's something everyone connects with. I connect with that personally. I feel like some days you don't, you don't want to get out of bed. And it's just not because anything traumatic happened, maybe just because I'm not happy at the moment. But then the next day, I can go out and talk to everybody and be super energetic and happy. And that's just a part of being human. <coughs> you just have to handle both sides and realize that, that all of that is you, and that's OK. So for the first piece about the Buddhist woman who was queer and black, um, I neither, so I had no personal experience for that, but um, I, I've been doing a paper over the LGBTQ community and transgenders in specific and how they've been struggling recently, so I kind of took some inspiration from my research from that to portray the character. And for the second character, Layla Ahmed, um, one of my friends growing up was Muslim, and obviously with the current government and stuff, there's so many misconceptions about like Muslims and there's so many issues going on. So I kind of took into account how she would feel. She lives in Canada, she doesn't live here. But I kind of took into account how she would feel if she lived here and how she would voice her concerns and talk about her religion. Oh, well, an easy way to 
connect to what this one was, don't tell my mother, but I am a very bad Christian. I am so petty. So, <laughs> so I totally understood when she would talk about how it, you had to have grace, which is something they talk about in like Catholic school all the time. You had to like have grace to forgive the people that wrong you, to go above that, to be better than that, so you could be closer to God. But I'm, we're only human, and sometimes you do want to get mad, and you, it's hard to process getting being wronged and getting over you and feeling isolated because. I grew up in Sri Lanka. I, it's a predominantly Buddhist country. I am, I am a totally different skin color and growing up it's either one way or the other somebody would differentiate me in some way. Even though I was there for 15 years, I was always out there being different and trying to just find a place in yourself where you're happy being you is not an easy place to get to. So, yeah. So, any follow-up comments or questions, for, especially for our actors? Yes? I just have a comment, because this is the fourth in a series where uh, the three years before were uh, historical voices, women who had lived a long, long time ago, in many cases, centuries and centuries earlier. Um, so I came to this wondering what contemporary voices were going to come across like, and my first reaction was one of sadness, mm -hmm. because I thought, this is what the women of centuries ago were talking about also in, in different ways, but it's so sad we're still dealing with this. Um, uh, so many of the issues are, are still present and have been for so long. But by the end of listening to the five different voices, I suddenly started thinking in a different way. And I, I think what I'm hearing is a lot of leadership, that these, th these five voices really found a way to not fit into a structure, but to change it and show us how to humanize it. Um, so in many ways, I think they're actually giving us guidelines how to be more human. Um, is that something that you guys were thinking about when you were doing the action as, as what's going on? Yeah, like for Monica's piece especially, because I feel like she went through this experience and the whole monologue is basically about how if you've gone through a, an experience like that, it's okay to like veer off what people tell you to say. They tell you that you don't need a doctor, you just need Jesus, you need to feel better, you have to have faith. And sometimes you need more than that. And she's saying that it's okay to rely on medicine, it's okay to rely on things on earth because God in, 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 her, in her monologue, he gave you that tool. So use the tools that are here and be okay with that. So it's, it's really a guideline of how to be okay with who you are. And she's expressing that I am who I am and basically you are too. And her story is kind of supposed to reflect everybody's story. And that in the end, you're okay, you're who you are, and that's who you're supposed to be. Does that make sense? They're really remarkable. To follow up on that, I think one of the things that's so powerful about Jesuit spirituality is um, the principle of finding God in all things. Some of you might be familiar with that idea, finding God in all things. And what I think when we look at religion from the top down, it has these rigid structures and these categories of belief. And it's very androcentric, um, very, very heteronormative. And if we look at religion from the bottom up, from the real people who are practicing and handing on the tradition, it's oftentimes non-normative. Right? It's oftentimes women, it's oftentimes women of color. It's, you, know, you look at across the religious traditions, especially in, in the global south and in the global east, that, that um, the bodies that institutionalize ritual and practice are female and non-heteronormative. And, um, and if we are thinking as a Jesuit institution here at LMU, what does it mean to find God in that way? You know, outside of those top, that top-down hierarchical, institutionalized 
androcentric, heteronormative framework, and we find all these voices. And, and in that sense, it's not just a story of tragedy, it's a story of resilience and power. And one of the things about focusing on contemporary women, I mean, look at the Me Too movement and everything that's happening right now, it's, and it's not just a Western thing. Women are speaking out globally. And, um, and we're learning more and more from sources of faith and the sacred that um, are non-binary and fluid and, um, and brown. And um, to open ourselves up to that possibility, it's not to say either or, it's to say what can we learn. And I think what we can learn is a story of resilience and power. Um, one of the things that I was sensitive to is not to, to look for sources where it was all about poor brown women, we need to go in you know, and charge in as our white savior, Rita Nakashima Brock, that's her big thing, is that Christianity is all about this one male savior, you know, charging in on a horse, a knight in shining armor. And if we think about Jesus instead as a part of a community who he was vulnerable to, where women were present to him, um, that we come up with a whole new vision of religion and faith. And, um, and it's very empowering. It doesn't have to be top down. It doesn't have to be oppressive. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, I grew up a mixed brown girl in a virtually all-white Catholic parish in St. Louis, Missouri. I am perfectly aware, you know, of the challenges of religion. And my twin brother, you know, had to deal with a pedophile priest at his church. I completely get, you know, all of the, the problems that we see with religion today. And yet, there's more. There's so much more out there for us if we open our hearts to it. Any other comments or questions? Jan? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the actors went through a trans transformative Ooh. process mm -hmm. going from the spoken word to the active word. Great question. Who wants to do that? Do you want to? Okay, so for my piece, I initially picked it out because it was so like rhythmic in the words, and I and I loved the story, and it had a very pivotal moment in it where. Um, Kevin, who, Kevin Whitmore, who was helping me, we sat down, we were reading this, and by the time we got to like the third paragraph, we were really realizing that this was like a conversion story. This is like, she saw herself in this place, and she realized that she didn't have to be there, like, that it was okay to go beyond, and she transformed herself. And I think that was a really pivotal moment to really seeing Monica, the person, instead of just the words. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like you don't hear a lot of Muslim women speaking out and stuff just because they're just so hindered because of their culture by men. So I kind of had my own take on what this person would sound like. Um, I just kind of made her my own person and used her words and, like I said, my friend's experiences to how I thought the person would react. A transformative moment, like words to picture or words to point. Oh, definitely toward the end of the piece that I was reading. I had a very t hard time understanding what that meant up until a couple of days ago just because there was, she mentions isolation so much and that says so much about her. And the longer I thought about that, and because I related it up to, to her stories up to that point, and I was just like, and then I realized how she, how did I say this? I just realized how she felt cynical about being Christian in a way and normally I imagine she was like a very active Catholic up until a point and I was happy knowing that it's not just me that sometimes gets frustrated or resents some preachings because it's just so hard to accomplish and that's what we're expected to do otherwise we're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. um, and so just that like 
her last part where she says that Jesus could possibly, like, Jesus must be divine because if he, like, if he went through what I went through and he came out okay, but I know that it's next to impossible, then, yeah, it's just something else. Any other comments? Questions? So, you said this was a four-year journey for you as you were putting these stories together? I mean, how, how long were you working with these stories? Oh, when did we start? Six months? Six months, six months. Oh, six six months, months. ago, but, and then as you were finding the mm -hmm. stories. Was there something that challenged you or that you found as you were going through and, and, and even choosing the stories and thinking about these various women for yourself? I think my challenge was narrowing the field because I'm very conscious that women of color do not all think the same way or have the same experiences. And so I didn't want to have the Asian voice, the black boy. You know what I mean? I was very conscious of not wanting to stereotype or convey this idea that there is a sameness to what's happening. So that was one challenge. Multiplicity. Um, without homogenization, but in a manageable time frame. <laughs> the other challenge was, I, I really, the intersection of gender, sexuality, race is um, very important. And I oftentimes feel, um, when I talk in white feminist circles, um, that I'm not towing the orthodox line in some way. And I'm not saying the right thing, or I don't believe the right thing. So I'm sort of very sensitive to how race and gender have these interlocking realities. And I, I may agree more with, um, you know, with somebody who's who is Filipino, than a, a man who's Filipino, than I might with a white woman, for example, or I might not. So that these are very complex realities that I didn't want to water down. And I wanted to somehow show that interlocking reality that for women of color, it's not just about race and it's not just about gender. It somehow coalesces in some new animal. Um, but it's not like you can go through somebody's book and find one paragraph that's like intersectionality right there. You know, you'd like to think that in somebody's journey they would sum it all up in some great story that said it all. Nope. You know, like different things come out at different moments of one's life. You know, when I was growing up, you know, gender would have had a flashpoint here and race had a flashpoint there. And so that was also a challenge, is the selecting it down. Just, you know, Monica Coleman in her book has um, this beautiful way of connecting the history of mental illness in her family with slavery and the history of slavery in her family. And um, it is just, it's devastating and brutal and so true. But to get through, to, to be able to communicate that whole narrative in her book, it would be too much. So then I just focused on a couple of these moments of her coming to her struggle of really finding a diagnosis um, in her depression. So those were a few of the challenges. And then I would send Rachel something and she'd be like, oh, that might be a little too long. <laughs> Maybe a few more people, and I say, I have a list. It's a short list of ten people. <laughs> so that that was my my challenge. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Um, I don't know. If, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if my voice is carrying well, but um, as people say, like religion is becoming kind of organized religion is becoming less of a presence in like societies worldwide, um, especially like Western societies, but just generally worldwide, and people are becoming more secular. But in the, at least in the like little snippets of these women's lives that we heard, they almost seem to be reimagining or reforming religion from like their own individual experience, but like pursuing their faith in a, in a way that captured their right realities mm -hmm. in a way that religions haven't for very long histories, all, many religions, most religions. Um, so I'm wondering, looking forward as people start to say, or as people say, religion is becoming less 
um, valuable to society? Is that just our current understanding of mm -hmm. how religion is actually existing? And, our, and is, is that just a, a reimagining that we haven't seen before um, of faith? Karis, you asked such a good question. Part of it is this thing um, that Leila Ahmed points to, which is that um, there's an official religion, an institutional religion, it's a men's religion, and that's what scholars have tended to study. And in that regard, religion is becoming less and less influential, and the society is becoming more and more secular. So if we conceive of religion as something that you do outside the home, um, under the purview of hierarchs, um, and that there's an official institutional structure, then um, I would agree that globally that there, there is less attendance, less institutional affiliation, etc. However, if you look at it from the bottom up, from the, the mass of people who are practitioners doing it in the home, around family rituals, around celebrations, um, I don't know that people are practicing religion any less than they were before. But like you're saying, it's t it may be taking a different form. Or maybe we're just noticing that form. Um, because like with Leila Ahmed's point, is that her whole, like she had no concept of this official Islam until she went to Europe to study Islam. And then she got the official male version of Islam <laughs> taught by male scholars. And that was like had nothing to do with how she experienced Islam. And so her point was that, that wait a minute, who's teaching people Islam? Uh, the moms and the grandmas. Not just the girls, but the boys. So people's first access to religion is oftentimes through the mothers in the home. And globally, much of religious practice happens through the mothers, the grandmothers, and in the homes. I mean, I know a lot of us have grandmas who like waylay us before we leave the house to make sure they do a prayer over us and do, you know, like whatever they do. They insist on having something blessed for us and then they shove it in our backpack. <laughs> and these are these are the these are the practices that always were there, um, but we're noticing them and we're honoring them more. And I don't know that that's lessened. So I think, Karis, it depends on the perspective that you take. Um, and I, I don't think that religion, institutional religions may be less and less important, but religious practices and spiritual traditions and their connections between people that is going to endure. But even at the official level, this I have a pet peeve about this, because even at the official level, we all know who runs the churches and the temples and the synagogues. It's the old ladies. <laughs> it's the ones who go, right? It's old ladies. And if they don't like the priest or you know whoever it is, they're, they're gone. Bye-bye. So, um, so even at the official level, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negotiation and power play that happens behind the scenes. But scholars haven't been trained until more recently to notice those things. Um, I've talked about this a lot in like various different classes that I've had. Um, and there's this debate about the difference between religion and spirituality. Um, so how would you define the two? Mm -hmm. um, do you see them as something that can be intertwined? Because I know, like, especially within our generation, a lot of people sound spiritual, I'm spiritual. Yeah. Um, do you think that's something different than maybe it is? I'm just asking because I like. No, it's a great question. And I, whenever people say I'm spiritual but not religious, I say, well, I'm religious but not spiritual. <laughs> but I don't actually know what I'm saying. I just say that. <laughs> there is somebody sitting behind you who is an expert in spirituality. So I am going to pass the buck to him. Nice How would you Dr. T. <laughs> How would you define the difference? You're the expert. You have to tell us. Sorry. No, it's just um, I think it's like you're saying with a lot of things this evening. It's very complex, and people flee from religion for many good reasons, and yet they can't seem to flee from what's deep within them. This hunger that drives them, and they want to claim that and reclaim that. I think it's a struggle in this moment, and some people find themselves even a little bit lonely in their spiritual search, and they gravitate back toward communities, or a sangha, or something. And I think there's a possibility to retrieve a meaningful relationship with 
religion as community. We all need that. It's how traditions get passed on, informally, with the grannies, of course, <laughs> but also through the rituals of initiation and marriage and when people die, we want to ritualize that moment appropriate, and, and, and we need traditions for that. So there are important distinctions, and, and yet I think we're in a moment culturally when people are really struggling to ask themselves whether they can uh, hold them together or integrate them or reintegrate them. That's, that's what I would say. So just a few things before we end. If you would fill out the feedback forms that are under your chairs and slip them into this box to enter a raffle. And if you need class credit, please find John in the bow tie and he'll swipe your one card. And third, our um, Archives and Special Collections Gallery will be open until 7 so you can see our sister exhibit for this program, Meeting Christ in Faith and Art. Please don't bring your food or water. But also, please eat our food and drink our water before you come by. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This was an amazing turnout. Thank you, Tracy.